About a year ago, I wrote an article for Fortune about how there seemed to be this increasing uh, frequency of women being named to the COO role in tech companies. And I thought, you know, wow, this is kind of a thing. And I just wrote an article about it, and I asked for feedback, and I got a lot of feedback. And the result is I have this list now of 33 women COOs in tech, so including these three women. So I'm really excited to talk about this role, what it is, uh, and why, why so many women. So why don't we start? It's kind of a role that really depends um, company by company. So why don't we each, I'd love for you to each just briefly tell the audience what your role is exactly. Claire, why don't we start with you? Claire left Google after 10 and a half years. About a year ago, she just passed her year anniversary at Stripe, the very fast growing startup, so uh, to be the COO. So what is the COO role at Stripe? Yeah, it's really responsible for our core operating functions, so scaling up a lot of our user functions, sales, account management support globally, and then also our internal sort of people functions, uh, recruiting, HR, and I do a lot of cross-stripe sort of operating approach, goals, annual planning. We're doing our first plan right now, super fun. Um, and that's, that's what it is, it's right. And why was that, did that feel like a risky move to leave Google and, and the home you'd known for so long in a pretty big role, VP of Google X to take this risk? Um, I think it seems risky in that um, I, had a, I really had a great uh, role at Google and I loved Google and it was terrific for me. But in terms of my own learning curve, it, it, it just wasn't in the same place, and I kind of had this yen to get back to building. And Stripe is just incredibly disruptive and has a huge opportunity to really alter the economic infrastructure of the internet. And I just thought, and I care a lot about job creation and economic development, and it sort of just sang to my mission and also a chance to sort of do it myself a little bit. So in some ways, it was a professional development move, and I'm really rewarded. I'm really challenged right now in a great way. It's great. Marnie, tell us about your day-to-day -day at Instagram. I actually have here that you handle HR, policy, money-making, partnerships, business operations. Is that really right? And how do you do all of that? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having this panel and thank you for having me here today. Um, yeah, so I've been in the role of CEO at Instagram now for um, about a year and I think I joined at a really exciting time. Um, our community has been growing uh, really quickly. We now have 400 uh, million monthly actives. Feel free to Instagram while I'm talking. I'm totally cool with that. Our business is, um, our business is uh, growing really quickly too. I oversee all those functions you mentioned. So the, really the business functions, whether it's advertising, marketing, partnerships, HR, recruiting, communications, policy, um, and so forth. And what I really try to focus on is that as we scale the company, ensuring that we're providing value to all of our stakeholders, whether that's an advertiser or a partner, or even somebody in the Instagram community who uses the service um, every day. I think one thing that make, might make my role uh, unique is that in 2012, Facebook acquired Instagram. And so I have the responsibility of growing and scaling a company within a company. And that has its own set of unique challenges, but also opportunities. Um, I have to say, there's most definitely no real playbook for this role, um, but I think that's what makes it so fun and interesting. So it doesn't really follow the COO of Facebook, which is a very prominent uh, role and person, Sheryl Sandberg. Is it modeled after her role, your role at Instagram? I look at, um, I think there's a lot of ways where working with Sheryl have, has been phenomenal. Um, and she's been able to really coach and mentor me in the role in terms of how to think about it. But also, um, I'm in the day-to-day -day of Instagram, and so I really need to think about what's the right organizational model for Instagram, what's the right kind of culture for Instagram, and what are the ways that we're gonna seek to reinvent ourselves, stay fresh, and offer value to our community. Pam, what about you? Tell us about your role at Infor. So Infor, for those who are not aware, we're an enterprise software company. We're the third largest business applications company in the world. Um, my role is I manage revenue uh, functions, subscription revenues, cloud revenues. I manage g &A functions like legal business practices, HR facilities, real estate, blah, 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 blah. And I manage some product development functions as well. Um, so a mixture of, of, of everything. I mean, I would say that pretty much everything passes my, my desk. So that's the role that I have it in for. So the theme here is this 
is a whole lot of stuff under one role. It's a lot of large responsibilities, multitasking at the highest level. It's an incredible amount of responsibility. So is there, is this really a thing? Is this a role that is better suited to women? I mean, my, you know, it's anecdotal. I don't have any statistics, mm -hmm. but it just seems to me like this is a role that increasingly is being filled by uh, high profile women. I, I think, for me, I think women have a clarity on execution, and, and a lot of my male counterparts, I've worked with many brilliant men over the years, but they often, you know, many of them have said, look, I've got almost ADD in terms of wanting to jump from one thing to, to the other. Um, whereas I think with women, there's that clarity of execution that they need to, you know, you have a company strategy, now go execute on it. I think that's one big component. I also think that women have a great ability to multitask. I mean, we have to manage the home, we have to juggle kids, husband, everything else. Um, and this role, as you rightly said, is very broad, it's very diversified. And so you've, that multitasking capability, I think, is, is super important. So. I don't think we have enough women in the CEO roles, and we should be focused on getting more women in that role. Um, I also think that we shouldn't stop there, and we should make sure that we get more women who, to be CEOs, CTOs, CIOs in any of the C-suite level roles. And I think the way that we can get there is that um, we should try to find opportunities to um, uh, create opportunities for women at all levels of the companies in tech companies. Um, when you think about it, though, tech companies are growing um, and evolving so quickly, and um, there's no real path for preparation for these roles. For example, when I was in business school, I couldn't have ever prepared specifically for the role of COO. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have even really imagined that I was going to be at Instagram because Instagram didn't exist at that point. So um, you really have to, we really need to think about hiring good, strong athletes to bring them into um, these tech companies. And then once they're there, any good athlete um, should engage in, in cross-training. So we should look at cross-training opportunities. I love that. This is a cross-training role. A cross-training exactly role. It is. Give, um, look for opportunities to give women more exposure to different, comp different functions across the company. And let me just give you an example. Just the other day, I took a woman who um, is in partnerships, and I brought her to an advertising meeting. She learned a ton. She added a ton of value in that meeting. And she was pushed out of her comfort zone and given exposure to a new function that was able to help her imagine um, you know, where she might want to take her career next. And so I think looking for those cross-training opportunities, giving women more exposure across the company will help prepare them for roles in the future. So Claire, do you think that this increasing um, preponderance of women in the COO role, do you think that it is creating a pipeline? That is this a stepping stone for future CEOs? I mean, it, it is, tr it, it is, the cross-training analogy is great. You run the whole company in, in many ways. So do you think this means we'll see more women CEOs in tech? You know, I'm conflicted about this because, first of all, 33 is great, but it's not that many. There's a lot more tech companies Absolutely. than that. And yeah. so well, those I, are only the people that read my article and wrote in. So, so <laughs> more people write in so we can get the data. But I, I feel like there's, I know plenty of male COOs, and I do think it's a certain capability that has to do with execution clarity and follow through. I also think there's an element of the role that is about caretaking for sort of turning inward to a company and caretaking for its development as an organization and organization building. And I think of the CEO role as often more about the, the entity of the company externally right. or thinking about the product and what, it, what you're bringing to the market. I think that varies by company. Um, I do I think context switching is a huge part of the role, um, especially because you are switching sort of between internal and external a lot more in the role. And I believe women have 12% more prefrontal cortex, and we're better at context That's fact. switching. Write it down. Um, <laughs> so I, I think that is an advantage for us. Uh, but mostly, I'm a little worried that it's becoming a meme a little bit, which mm. is get a woman in the COO role and that it's not a pipeline to CEO, or I, I, I don't know, I feel like well, that, that may be a, a thing we want to watch out for. You've seen that with CFO a long time ago. Women exactly. started rising to the CFO ranks, but it is such a specific role that it, 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 I think that is a little bit more of a silo. I think there's an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to open it up for questions in a minute, but another 
question I had for you, Claire, is you know, you're, you came into this startup where these very young co-founders, Patrick and John Collison, their brothers, um, is part of your role kind of managing them and developing them? And I mean, I think of Sheryl Sandberg when she stepped in and Mark Zuckerberg was so young and so, you know, she helped kind of form him as an executive as much as all the other stuff. You know, I spent a ton of time with them before I took the position because the chemistry between us was going to be really critical, I think, to the success for me in the role, but also for Stripe. Um, John and Patrick have a ton of vision and really high IQ and EQ, which I've met many founders, which is pretty unusual. And it felt very much like a collaboration. There are p pieces of it that they're bringing to the table that I couldn't bring in terms of what they see in, in the opportunity to, to really reinvent how you think about sort of a, a technology platform for, for payments and for economic sort of business building. Um, but there are things that, I, that we have some coaching on where we talk through, you know, how would you do this? What does this look like at scale? And how do we make the right steps now to get to that place we all want to be you know, a few years from now? Um, but it's much more collaborative than it is about I'm sort of helping them with things they don't know. I'm, I'm often surprised at how many insights they have uh, without any having seen it before. Uh, and so it's a very interesting conversation between us. Marty, what's your relationship like with Kevin Systrom, CEO and co-founder of Instagram? So we have um, we actually have two co-founders of Instagram, and they are both uh, still there. It's Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger. And um, when I was uh, interviewing for the role, um, I spent time uh, with both of them, and I totally agree with you that you got to make sure that the that the chemistry was right. But one of the most um, one of the most compelling reasons to make the switch from Facebook over to Instagram was to have the opportunity to work with both Kevin and Mike um, because they are um, they had a great vision for, and they have continue to have a great vision for Instagram. Um, they are uh, very smart on both um, the vision and the product. And they are also two of the loveliest people who I have ever met. And so working with them um, every day um, is, is a real treat because I'm continually learning from them. And I agree with you that it is, um, it's a collaboration. I think the way Kevin described it was that it was a partnership. Um, in terms of how we, um, in terms of how we approach the business and um, and the product, and I've just been, um, I've been so impressed with how welcoming they've been and um, and how encouraging they have been to just embrace opportunities and really ha have impact and um, and um, have given me a great deal of autonomy, and it's been great. Pam, what's the hardest thing about your role? Let's say the hardest thing. Traveling, I would have to say. So we're present in over 200 countries and territories. So it's hard to get away from the need to, to travel. I have two young kids, um, and so I've become a master at understanding every airline in the world. And, and how, you live here, but your company's based in New York. Yeah, so I'm head, headquartered in New York, live here, refuse to move to New York. No disrespect to New York, but I love California. <laughs> um, so I, I travel you know, quite a bit. So traveling is the hardest part, but you, you, you master travel schedules and how to do you know, red eyes so that you minimize, that you can put your kids to bed as much as possible. Um, but also, the rest of the executive team seem to love sending me to the most undesirable regions of the entire world. I have to tell you a funny story. A few years ago, um, I had to go to this area of the world where women have no place in society, very low ranked, and I had a really hard time there for a number of reasons. Number one, um, I was a very low class in society. I couldn't look at a man. I had to be chaperoned everywhere. I was covered from head to toe in a hijab and a abaya. Um, it was, I was six or seven months pregnant, and it was 120 degrees. It was just horrible. And I was, uh, couldn't wait. I was, the first time I smiled was when I was at the airport ready to go home, and four security guards came up and approached me. And I thought, oh, no, 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 this cannot be happening. So in very broken English, they said, uh, do you have authorization to get on the airplane? And I said, oh, yeah, I have a visa liking my visa. And they said, no, do you have authorization to get on the airplane? And they looked squarely at my stomach. Now, my body shape was not exactly linear at that point in time, being six or seven months pregnant. So I thought to myself, oh, I got to think on my feet here. They're not going to let me on the aircraft. So I just thought, I looked them in the eye and I said, are you suggesting that I'm pregnant? Oh. <laughs> and... Uh, uh. 
I have never seen such guys looking at each other, looking down, looking at each oh other, thinking, oh my God, what are we going to do here? And one thing I learned is that cultural differences aside, religious differences aside, there's one thing that transcends all cultures and all religions, which is that you should never call a woman or tell a woman that she's fat. <laughs> so, I got that on the aircraft, so but um, oh yeah, I, I generally do tend to get, you know, sent to places that where is literally amazing. the boys, as I call them, yeah. never want to go to. That is so yeah. funny. Who has a question for this panel? We have a little limited amount of time. Um, I need to, we need to have the mic. Uh, so we'll go right here in the front row, but please wait for the mic. And uh, please announce yourself also. Hi, Tammy Medard, CEO of ANZ in Laos. Um, my question to the panelists is, how did you manage salary negotiations when you took on the big roles? <laughs> Good question. We have two minutes, so we have to either do 30 seconds each. I think that's what we have to do. Claire, why don't we start with you? I got advice from friends who'd gone through it. I got a good lawyer. And Patrick said afterwards, I never want to negotiate with you again. <laughs> <laughs> Marnie? Uh, I consulted a wide variety of people. I used to work for Larry Summers, and Larry Summers once said that whenever I'm making a decision, um, I consult so many people that people who have launched presidential campaigns have had fewer advisors than I have had. <laughs> so I get as much information as um, I possibly uh, as I possibly can, and um, I stay focused on what is important to me, and um, and just work my way through the process. But also explaining that when you're going into a role that you are being hired to negotiate is a really disarming way of entering the negotiation um, about your salary. Mm -hmm. Pam? And I did all of the above, but I also had the benefit of having some male colleagues start around the same time as me. And so literally, I was brutally honest with them, saying, I'm getting whatever you're getting. So Great. that helped. You guys were so good at that. I think we have time for one more if it's really short. Um, anyone? Anyone? Here we go, right here. There's a mic. The mic is coming right behind you, yeah. Uh, hi, Anna Tunkel, Epco Worldwide. Um, I wanted to, I don't know if you have daughters. Uh, I have a daughter and a son. And there's so much focus lately on Girls in STEM, which is an amazing initiative and, uh, uh, and a lot of focus on girls in tech. Um, what would you advise, um, what, what is the skill set for girls of the future, little girls, not necessarily tech focused, because I I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> just wanted to ask you. Good question. Now we really have like 30 seconds total. So <laughs> I have a daughter. Um, she just turned 10. And her class had a brainstorm about passion projects. And it ranged from strawberries to curing cancer, but I, which I loved. But I think that the answer for me is I just want to cultivate her curiosity and her confidence and resilience. And I don't know if she'll go into STEM. And I want her to just be happy. So I do sometimes worry we get obsessed about a certain direction when it's more about a skill set. I mean, I work in STEM, and I never thought that I would. And I think that's something to just, but I was always curious, I was always learning, and I always liked a new challenge. And I thought, that's what I want for her. That's what I want for girls. Do either of you have a thought on that? Um, I don't have daughters, I have sons. Um, and I think what's really important is that we give um, young girls the same opportunities as boys. So again, as I was talking about, give them exposure to lots of different things. So a couple summers ago, I started by putting my, kid, my sons in an ID tech program around here, and there were no girls in the program. And uh, Cheryl Sandberg also had her uh, son and put her daughter in and then recruited um, some of her, you know, recruited her niece to also go in, and they recruited their friends. And so by starting and giving them the exposure and seeing whether they like it and then giving them the confidence and the support to continue with it, I think is a really great first step. We're going to have to leave it there. I have to say, all of your children have really incredible female role models right in front of them. So thank you for being here, and congratulations on all the work that you do. Thank you, Lee.